Hello everyone and welcome back to the Beatles Forever. Uh, today we're going to see the farm that Paul McCartney bought in Scotland and how it became a place for Paul to escape from all the difficulties he was going through at that time in his life. So what led Paul to the Highlands? In an interview Paul said, I was always drawn to the romantic notion of the Highlands and John was too. He had visited relatives who had a croft in the Highlands and he spoke romantically of it. So I had that thought in my head but I never really intended to do much with that thought. Then when we started to earn a little bit of money, there was an accountant who said, you should use the money for something. You should buy something with it. Whereas we'd always thought you just stick it in the bank. He said, no, you got to invest it. You got to do something. So I said, okay. And he came up with this property that was for sale in Argyle near Campbelltown. He said it would uh, be a great investment. I wasn't sure I wanted to go up. I just got down to London from Liverpool and I wasn't sure I wanted to go to Scotland. Anyway, I was persuaded, and I went there and thought, it's okay, but I never thought of it as romantic until I met Linda. And she said, could we go up there? And then with Linda and raising the kids there, I saw things I'd never seen before in the countryside and scenery and became really special. So about the farm, Paul bought the farm. It's 183 acres near Campbelltown in Kintyre Peninsula of Scotland. The three-bedroom farmhouse had been had the asking price of $35,000, and it came with 183 acres of land, so that's a lot. <laughs> it was previously owned by the local farmer, Mr. Brown, and his wife, who had lived there for 19 years before moving to Campbelltown. So the farm wasn't in that great a shape, and Jane Asher, though, convinced Paul to buy it to get away from the Beatlemania. And Paul said, it's desolate, very desolate. It's 200 acres in a valley and 30 miles from Ireland. It's in Scotland, but I mean, it's just off the coast of Ireland. It's nice. It's cold, very cold in the winter, and it gets lots of snow. Anyway, I didn't really pick Scotland. It's just I wanted a farm, and I said to my accountant, what's happening with my money? And he said the best thing you could do is buy a house. I mean, he's thinking about the safety of money, because if you put it in other things, it sort of goes. And I told him I'd like it with a bit of land, and he looked out for me. And he found this farm in Scotland, which was cheap, and it was nice and quiet. See, what I'm going to do is let the trees grow on it because it's very desolate at the moment and build a small house on it and go for a couple of months a year. So Paul McCartney said that in Beatles Off the Record by Keith Badman in 2008. Okay, Paul didn't know much about being a handyman when they first moved there, but he decided to learn more about it. Paul said, I'm, I would make a table, a little stool or something, and use the old wood and just cobble it together until one of my cousins, who was a builder, said, you should get some new wood. Wow, a light bulb moment. So I started getting better at it, and eventually I did make a table, a proper kitchen table, and got better at all these little skills like chopping wood, driving a tractor, and so on. And later on, when I started living on the farm down south, I would make trails in the woods for us to ride horses on, taking an axe or a chainsaw out and making a path, and then go in the next week to be completed, and we'd ride through on our horses. Those kind of things were satisfying in a completely different way to anything I'd been used to. I'd been a city boy, he said. So High Park Farms is about 20 miles from the Mullock Tire, the most southwesterly point on the peninsula, which he immortalized in his song. And over the years, Sir Paul has bought up five farms in total on Kintyre, so in that effect, he's gotten the glen to himself. But things weren't always rosy on the farm. Linda had her hands full when the Beatles broke up, and Paul was on the farm drinking, trying to escape all his troubles. Paul said when the Beatles broke up, there we were, left with the wreckage. It was very difficult to suddenly not be in the Beatles after your whole life except for your childhood. I've been involved in this thing, the very successful group. I'd always say I can really identify with some unemployed people because once it was clear that we weren't doing the Beatles anymore, I had real withdrawals and serious problems. I started drinking and not shaving. I didn't care. I just thought, that's the end of me as a singer, songwriter, composer, because I hadn't got anyone to do it with unless I work out another way to do it. And gradually, Linda got me out of it. She'd say, come on, this can't go on, you know. You're good. You're either going to stop doing music or you better get on with it. Paul McCartney said that from The Beatles Off the Record by Keith Badman. Linda said, I, I was very scared. I didn't want to give up, but it was a mess. It was unreal, and I had to handle this all by myself. There was no choice. I had to try. We had two children. We'd just been married a year, and my husband didn't want to get out of bed. 
He was drinking too much. He would tell me he felt useless. I knew he was torturing himself, blaming himself for the breakup, and I was sure that he could get beyond it. But if he didn't believe in himself, what could you do? What could I do? I could only try, and that's all I could do. Let me tell you, my hands were full. So Linda said that from Linda McCartney by Danny Fields. Paul said he didn't know how anyone could have lived with him at that time. To him, he felt like he was on the scrap heap. Paul had been cocky, as he described himself, and he never had a blow to his confidence until the Beatles broke up. He said Linda had it bad because he would not get out, want to get out of bed, and when he did, he wouldn't be up that long before he went back into bed. And he started drinking more and more, and he stopped shaving because he knew he wasn't going anywhere, so what did it matter? So he said he was pretty morbid at this time. But Linda, as we know, snapped him out of it by saying he was a Beatle. She got him thinking about creating music again, and wings were formed. But sadly, it sounds like Paul doesn't seem to go there much anymore. The Daily Record said the family loved the farm up until Linda's untimely death in the late 90s. Now it appears that it holds too many memories for Paul, as he rarely returns. And Linda's life's been commemorated through the locals who loved her with a bronze statue and a memorial garden built for her in Campbelltown, so that was pretty special. And it's said that Paul spends most of his time either in London or in Manhattan, New York, the state where his wife is from. So it sounds like the farm was just what Paul needed at the time in his life, and when the pressures of the Beatlemania and the ending of the Beatles happened, he spent precious time in nature, and with his growing family and wife, Linda, it was there that he had songs that inspired him. Songs like Mull of Kintyre, the long and winding road, coming up, ebony and ivory, and jet, which he wrote on his entire farm. And he recorded the first demos in a, in a converted barn he dubbed the spirit of Renatchen. If Linton hadn't seen the charm of the place, Paul wouldn't have become enchanted with it. It would never have been fixed up. The farm saved Paul and inspired him to find his music muse again, to which we could all be thankful. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would be great. And I hope everybody's been having a good day, and tune in again soon for another episode of The Beatles Forever. Thank you. Bye.